sharing good news of great joy to all people. Elation Church. Welcome to Elation Church. We're so excited that you're joining in with us today. Before we open up God's Word, let's pray together. Father God, thank you for today. We thank you for each and every person watching. I pray that you'll give us ears to hear what your Spirit has to say to us through your Word today. In Jesus' name, amen. For the past seven weeks, we've been in a series entitled Faith Act. I hope you've enjoyed it. hope you've learned a lot from it. I know I have. It's been just a huge encouragement to me, and I hope that it's been encouraging and really life-changing for you too. But we're talking about faith that does. Um, There's more to faith than believing. That's what we've been learning about in this series. There is more to faith than just simply believing. A lot of times when we think of faith, we just think, well, I believe I have faith if I just believe. But faith is so much more than that, as we've seen. The faith that pleases God Um, is a faith that responds, a a faith that gives, a faith that does, and a faith that acts, right? It's not passive, it's active. And belief without action, as we have seen, does not see the promised results. The things and the the precious promises of God, if we're just believing them, we're not going to see the results. We're not going to see those things happen in our life without actions, without those faith actions. And we've also looked at that things are not just up to God. (laughs) Um, We play, each one of us play a significant part in the things that happen in our lives, in the the miracles that happen in our lives, um, and just the the power of God on display in our lives. We play a part in that um, because, as we'll see, faith is a significant part for the believer. Um, Just a few of these verses, we'll we'll recap a little bit. Ephesians 2.8, says this, for by grace you have been saved through faith, right? It's by grace is what God has done. Grace is God's acts of kindness and favor towards you and towards me. That's what he does. And then our faith, right, through faith, we receive salvation. Um, That's the part of taking hold of God's promise of salvation. What he did on the cross, we're taking hold of that by faith, through faith, Um, And then Galatians 3.11, that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. The just shall live by faith. 2 Corinthians 5.7 says, for we walk by faith, not by sight. The people of God, we walk by faith. That's the sphere of our existence, right? We are walking by faith each and every day, not by what we see. 1 John 5.4, for every child of God defeats this evil world. And we achieve this victory, how? Through our faith. We achieve victory through our faith. Hebrews eleven six, and it is impossible to please God without faith. It's impossible to please God without faith. So if we're saved through faith, if we're called to live by faith, if we can only experience victory through faith, and we can only please God by our faith, faith is important. We need to be men, women, boys, and girls who are actively living by faith each and every day, standing in faith, and two, increasing in our faith. So real quickly, what is faith? Where does it come from? How do we have it? And how do we live it? Like we've seen in past weeks, the Bible is very clear on this, Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And that word there is divine utterance, meaning it's spoken or written word of God and being led by that. But we have to hear what God is speaking. We got to be students um, and seek his will. We need to hear from God. So the first step of faith, how do we have it? We hear it. We hear the divine utterance from God. Hebrews 11.1 goes on to say this and shows us our second step. Faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. This word hope, right, is elpo. It means confident expectation that we will see the goodness and promises of God fulfilled. It's not the world's definition of hope, like, well, I hope this will happen, or I hope, and we really don't know. No, what the Bible uses, when it uses that word hope, it means 
we can have a confident expectation that it's going to happen. Why? Because that is what God said. So we're putting our hope in what God says will happen. Therefore, we can have confidence that, it, that he is faithful to make it happen in our lives. So the second step of faith is wholeheartedly believing and having confidence in God's word, in what he said he can do and will do. And then as we look further, so we, we uh, James 2.26 says, faith without works is dead. So this is that third step again. Our faith is not only hearing, it's not only believing, faith has to do. Faith has action, a corresponding action. Because if it doesn't, faith without works, without action, is dead. Some people are like, well, what do we do, right? Well, we don't just make up what to do. Um, doing something without direction is simply presumption. Um, we must act on what God has said, on his God-given direction. So that's our third step of faith. It's acting in obedience to the word of God, to the word God has given us. So the connection point here to the manifestation of the power is when we act upon what God has said. So faith is gained by hearing, held by believing, but lived by acting. It's lived by our acting. You know, as Christians, we're real good about believing. We're real good about hearing and sort of taking hold of that. A lot of times it comes, you know, we fall short of and we, we come up short as far as actually doing what God has told us to do. Um, and like when the word of God says something and it's like, oh, we should do this. It's like sometimes we, we flounder around, right? And we don't act on it. And that's what this whole series is about is looking at the people in the Bible, because the Bible's full of scriptures and passages and all these incredible things and displays of the power of God, and we see that those are connected to those individuals' faith actions, that action to do what God said and to act in according to His Word. And today is another example of that. We're looking at, I would say, somewhat of a familiar story, um, it's found in Mark 5, 25 through 34. If you have your Bible, you can turn um, to this passage with me and read along. Um, but it says this, starting in verse 25. Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. So she's in a pretty bad place, right? It, her problem, it just keeps getting worse and worse. She sought other um, physicians and nothing has helped. But then in verse 27, when she heard about Jesus, when she heard about Jesus, you know, Jesus, as we can see throughout the Bible, he was very popular. Everywhere he went, things were happening. He was speaking with an authority that no one had ever heard before. And of course, it attracted people. People began to follow his ministry, follow him around, because they just wanted to hear what he had to say. And, but not just hear what he had to say, Jesus was doing some pretty significant things too. Everywhere Jesus went, people were being healed. The lame were, you know, walking, the blind were seeing, things were happening just all around him. And based on what she says here, on what she says a little bit later, and based on this lady's, this woman's actions, when it says that she heard about Jesus, it's most likely referring to um, Malachi 4.2 um, with the promise as a, as a Jewish woman, she would know what the, the prophecy was concerning the Messiah, the coming, the coming promise one of God. Um, and in that, it says that when the Messiah comes, he would have healing in his wings. That word wings is kanaf, and it means the edge of a garment. So when the Messiah comes, that he would have healing in the edge of his garment. Why is that significant? Let's keep reading. When she heard about Jesus, she said this, If only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. 
And we see that and we think, well, she might have just said that like once. No, um, that word said is the word lego, is the Greek word lego. And it means this. It means to lay forth in words. It's a systematic or set discourse um, where she was actively saying this same phrase over and over and over again. She's building on that each and every day. She was, she was saying this, if only I could get to Jesus and touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. If only I could say, you know, she keeps saying that. And this is really her first act of faith. This is her first act of faith. She spoke in agreement with what she believed, with that word up from God. She, in this, in her saying this, she's also saying and claiming that Jesus is the promised one from God. He is the Messiah. And she's, she keeps building this, this Lego to say, to lay forth in words that, you know, if I can only touch the hem of his garment, I will be made well. This is her confession of faith. And this is the first act of faith for many of us as Christians. This is an act of faith, is saying, putting our words in agreement with what God has said and just standing on his word, having the hope and the confidence of that what he says he will accomplish and, and just being bold about that and standing in faith with not only just our beliefs, but what we say each and every day. And I would just want to kind of do an example real quick, if you let me. This word Lego, when I saw it the first time, I, I immediately thought, you know, of Legos. <laughs> Um, I know growing up, I had Legos. I don't, I don't know when Legos came out, but I know I had them pretty early on. I remember I had a big blue tub of Legos that I would carry around, and um, I just loved them. They looked like this. If you've not seen Legos or not been exposed to that, um, just all different colors. They had fun colors, different sizes and shapes. And I would just sit around and just be really creative and, and build all sorts of things. Um, you know, some structures were more strong than others. Most of them would just break apart or they would be like wopsided, if you know what that means. Um, but I wouldn't really make anything significant. I would just put things together and see how, you know, just let my imagination run free. But uh, it was... I never really had one of those like kits. Not that my parents wouldn't buy me one, but uh, I just never really wanted that. I just always just like Legos and putting them together. Um, but see now they have all kinds of really great things, like really cool things that is, if I was a kid now, I'd be like, oh, I really want that. Um, but me on my own, I just use my own imagination and my own thoughts to come up with um, little designs and little things. It didn't really, didn't really accomplish a whole lot. It looked really cool. It wasn't really designed in a way um, to, to do anything or to be any specific thing. It was just out of my head. So I have these blocks. But today, you know, like I said, they have all these really cool things. And I couldn't have just taken these blocks and built like a, like a, you know, like a ship or a, or a, uh, something out of Star Wars. Star Wars is one of my favorite movies. Um, but I couldn't take these blocks and build something that looks like this. Right? My, my creations did not look like this at all. This is, this is pretty impressive. This looks like really realistic, like the movies. Like, it's pretty great. It opens a little bit. Um, it's really, really cool. But in order to get this, I didn't just have blocks that I just randomly put together with just my imagination. No, I had to have a few things, right? For one, in order to get this, I had to have an image right here of what the final product would look like. I had to see it. Everybody say see it. But in order for me to see this image, right, someone had to put this together. Someone had to figure out how all the blocks put together to make this, this product. And then to even like do a picture of it, right? 
So there had to be the manufacturer, Lego, put this together, figured out how their blocks would make a Star Wars X-Wing out of it. And then they put a picture of the finished product here so I could visually see it. This image, right, gave me vision of what I was supposed to build or what I could, what I could build with the products that they gave me, with the Legos, with the building blocks. Um, but then they not only showed me a vision, they not only supplied all the materials for this, they also gave me direction. They gave me pictures, because I like pictures. <laughs> they gave me some instruction, right? Some, some words to go off of in order to achieve what they told me I could build and what I could put together. And then this kind of got me thinking about this and about what we're talking about. The manufacturer, right, of the promises, of the grace, of all the things that God, the manufacturer is God, right? He's given us a vision of his promises and things that he wants to be and fulfill for us, things that he wants to do for us. Um, and then he gives us his instruction, his word, and he's wanting us to build those things. He's giving us everything that we need, right, in the box. <laughs> he's given us everything that we need to do what he's placed on our heart to do. God gives us the desires of our hearts, right? So he's like, he's given us the building blocks. He's given us the word and the instruction on how to do it or what he wants us to do. And then he is supplying all those things. But if I didn't take the time over the past couple of days to follow the word and to act upon it, I would never have built this. Even if I would have went like halfway and said, oh, well, maybe I'll just, I can do it now. I can just get my own blocks and start building and maybe I want it to look a little different or maybe I know better. It would not have turned out like this. I never would have been able to create what I should have. And that's the same thing with God and what we're talking about. Confessions, right? If I just make up something and say, confessions are merely words unless they are connected to the promise of God. We can say all sorts of things we want to happen or whatever, but unless it's connected to the promise, you'll never see the power. Let's continue on in our story. When she heard about Jesus, in verse 27, she did something. She did something. What did she do? She came behind him in the crowd. She came behind him in the crowd. So what does this mean? So she not only built this case with her words and with her confession, quoting what she had heard. She didn't just, she stood on that. She believed it. And then she acted upon it, right? She acted. Her first action was saying, putting her words in agreement with God's words. And then now she what? She had to get up. She had to walk. She had to go find Jesus, go to where he was at to get behind him. And when she gets to him, there's this huge crowd. So her second act of faith is she had to go where Jesus was. And then not only that, she had to press through the crowd. It wasn't easy to get to him. Um, you know, for a lot of people, if she, you know, if anyone else would have saw that crowd, they would have said, well, maybe he's busy. Maybe he's too busy. Maybe, maybe something, you know, it's just not worth my time. I don't want to get in that. I'm having all these issues. I don't feel well. I just, I don't want to go, right? When she saw the crowd and how difficult it was going to be, it would have been real easy to just give up in that moment. It would have been easier for her to just let her mind and all those things distract her and to just say, oh, you can't make it. Oh, there's no, there's no hope here. There's no reason to go. There's no reason to push through. Could have been easy to just walk away and give up. And if she would have done that, what would have happened? What would have happened? She wouldn't have seen um, her issues healed. She wouldn't have been healed. If she would have walked away, if she would have given up in that moment, um, even though she, she heard, even though she believed, and even though she said she could have just walked away from it all and not received 
what God wanted for her. Back again um, at the end of verse 27. So she came behind him in the crowd and then she did what? She touched his garment. So she pushes through all the people and all the stuff, finds her way to Jesus and touches his garment. Touches his garment, the edge of his garment. So the third act of faith here is that she touched the fringe of his garment. Um, it actually says fringe and the edge of his garment in, in, a different, um, in a different gospel, Luke 8, 44. If you want to look at that, it actually says she touched the fringe of his garment. So with her word, she said, if I can only touch this, I will be healed. And then now she pushes through the crowd. She doesn't let anything stand in her way. And then she touches the fringe of his garment. And what happens? What happens? In verse 29, we see immediately, I like that word, immediately, the fountain of her blood was dried up. And she felt in her body in that instance that she was healed of the affliction. She was immediately healed. So with her word, she built this case, her Lego. She saw it. She went towards it, followed Jesus, found him, pushed through the crowds, touches his garment, and what? Boom. The power of God, the promise of God, his, that healing of the Messiah, the promised one, immediately impacted her, immediately restored her, restored her to help. And Jesus immediately, knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? <laughs> but the disciples said to him, you see the multitude thronging you and you say, who touched me? Jesus, like there's so many people and everybody's bumping into one another. Who, well, you know, of course, they're saying, like hundred people just touched you. What does it, what does it matter? That's kind of the point here. There were many people hearing Jesus and bumping into him, but only one touched him in faith and received a miracle. Only one had built her faith and had said these things and had done these things and reached out in faith to God. Only one person had done that. There was a lot of people hearing him. There was a lot of people um, following him, maybe even believing what he was saying. But there was only one who came, who pushed through, who touched and received her healing. Mark um, 5.32 will continue on. And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. She didn't just run away. She, she sees what's happening. She she goes in front of Jesus, falls down before him, and tells him what she did and why she did it. And he said to her, Jesus turns and says to her, says, daughter, daughter, your faith has made you well. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Here, this is a super important thing that we need to learn, that we need to know and get a hold of. That, and it's, it's real clear right here in Scripture that we don't receive miracles based on God's ability. We don't receive miracles based on His ability. Jesus says why she received a miracle right here. Your faith has made you well. Your faith has made you well. Did he say, according to my ability? According to my ability? And I, No, you are well. No. He said, your faith has made you well. What did Jesus mean by that? He meant her faith actions. He didn't mean her just hearing or believing. He meant her, her saying her leaving, her, her going to him and standing on his word, reaching out in faith to be healed. That's what he meant here. That's what this faith is. Your faith has made you well. And I want to ask you something. Do we believe God has the ability to heal? I know this is a very 
and can be a very controversial topic, right? Healing in church. But we see all throughout scripture, Jesus continually healing people, laying hands on the sick, all these things happening. But then when it comes to our healing, when it comes to the healing of those around us, sometimes we, I think we kind of like, flounder a little bit. Well, will God heal me? Well, does he heal? I know he healed back then. What happened? Do we really, as Christians, do we believe God has the ability to heal? I think most Christians would say, yeah, God has the ability to heal, right? But let me ask you this. Do we receive, though, according to God's ability? Are we healed according to God's ability? Is that what this passage just showed us? No, no. God is able, right? He is able. He, is, he has the ability to heal, but do we receive? And did the people in the Bible receive according to their ability or did they receive according to their faith? See, faith is what connects God's ability to our reality. Faith is what connects God's ability to our reality. In scriptures, do we see Jesus ever refusing healing someone? Do we see him refusing um, to heal someone? Like in the Bible, anyone who like reached out to him in faith? Anyone who came to Jesus who was sick and said, Master, will you heal me? Will you, you know, can you do this? I've struggled with this. Did he ever say, no, I'm too busy? No, it's not for you. It's someone else. You know, I'll heal someone else, but I'm, I, the Father doesn't really want me to heal you today. But a lot of times as Christians, we kind of think of God that way, but that's a wrong understanding. Jesus never refused anyone in the Bible who reached out to him in faith. Let's just look at a few examples of this. Luke 4, 38 through 40 says this, As the sun went down in the evening, the people throughout the village brought sick family members to Jesus. And no matter what their disease, diseases were, the touch of his hand healed everyone. Their action of bringing their family members to Jesus, that action of faith, again, just like this lady coming to Jesus, touching the hem of his garment, that was an act of saying, you are the Messiah, we believe you can heal. That's what, you, that's what the word says, and we believe that you can do that for us. Um, that was their action. And as soon as God touched them, they were healed. Every single one. It doesn't say some of them. He healed everyone. Matthew 15, verse 29 through 31. Jesus returned to the Sea of Galilee, climbed a hill and sat down. A vast crowd brought to him people who were lame, blind, crippled, those who couldn't speak, and many others. They laid them before Jesus. And what? He healed them all. He healed them all. He didn't say, no, I'm not going to heal you or no, no. He healed them all. God's name reveals that healing is who he is. It's not just something he does. It's who he is and wants to be for us. We see in Exodus 15, 26, we get a name of God. And we went through that series about God's names, but one of his names is um, Yahweh. Uh, that's his proper name, the name of God. And uh, it's, uh, I'm not even going to try to pronounce it, but the way we phonetically sound it is Rapha. So it's Yahweh Rapha. And it simply means this, the Lord, or I am healer. I am healer. It was God telling us that, hey, this is who I am. This is what I am and can be for you and what I want to be for you. He wants to be our healer because that is who he is. That is, that is his identity. And that's how he wants us to approach him as a healer, as a healer. God has not changed. Some people say like, well, maybe he healed back then and maybe he could do those things back then in Bible times, but he's not healing today. I want to tell you Hebrews 13, 8 says otherwise, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What God did back then, he still is doing and will do and wants to do in and through your life. So do we believe God is our healer? That he wants us to be free from injury and disease? That he wants our bodies and our minds to be sound and whole? 
Do we genuinely believe that that is who he is? That is God's identity as a healer, and that's who he wants to be for us. Do we believe that? Do we believe that? If we don't believe that, we will not see his, his promises fulfilled in our life or who he is applied to our lives. But first, in faith, we have to believe, right? We have to believe that. We got to believe that God is who he says he is. He is Yahweh Rapha. He is our healer. He is our healer. He wants us to be free from all disease, for our minds and bodies to be whole, to be whole the way he originally intended, the way he originally wanted things to be, like in heaven. Just because something is the will of God, though, as we've looked through this series, it does not mean that his will is going to be done in our lives, right? Just because God wills it does not mean that his will is going to be done. What do we mean by that? Think about very early on in one of the first messages, we talked about God's people and them entering into the promised land and God having a place for them. And he said, I promise you this land, you're going to go, you're going to, you know, this is yours. He's given it to them. He leads them out of Egypt. He delivers them and he's sending them to a land that he's promised to give them. It was God's will for the Israelites to enter this promised land. But what happened? Especially this first wave. What happened? They died in the wilderness. They died in the wilderness. They wandered for 40 years in the wilderness and died. All of them died, right? So it was God, you know, it was God's will for the Israelites to, to take hold of the promise, to take this land. But when they got there, they said, we can't do that. There's giants in the land. And so their reasoning and their logic kept them from experiencing what God had for them and his will for them. God didn't want them to die in the wilderness. Instead of, it, instead of acting in faith and receiving the promise, they died in the wilderness. To say that, it well, that was just God's will for them to perish, right? That was God's will for us to learn, you know, and for us to learn from that. And all, no. To say that it was God's will for those Israelites to perish is to also say, we got to look at the connotation of that, that's to also say that their unbelief and their rebellion and their disobedience is the will of God. That's absolutely no way. That is not the will of God. If God's will is always done in the earth, why did Jesus tell us to pray for God's will to be done? When the disciples asked Jesus, God, how do we pray? What does he say in Matthew 6, 8 through 10? says this, the Lord's Prayer, as it's most, most known, says this, For your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. So God knows what we need before we even ask Him. He's all-knowing, right? The, the word there is omniscient. He, he knows all. Verse 9, pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Verse 10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God's omniscience, his knowledge, allows him to know our needs, allows him to, to provide for us because his omnipotence makes what we need available. Makes what we need available. And then faith takes hold of on earth what is known and available to us in heaven. So God's omniscience, it allows him to know and anticipate what we are going to need so he can supply those needs by his, by his power and by his might. He makes those available to us. And then our faith is what takes a hold of those things here on earth, the things that God has already made available to us in heaven. So we can receive those heavenly gifts and those heavenly promises that can be real to us and impact our life today here on earth. Amen. That's why it's important not to have this idea, this wrong understanding that God heals some and he denies healing to others according to his divine will. You might read something, you might come across some argument or theological stance that will say something along those lines because maybe they're trying to figure out why, you know, why God, it seems that way. 
and they, they look at it from that, but they don't really dig into what God's word says. Um, God does not just heal some and deny healing to others according to his divine will. Um, what he just picks and chooses for that would not be just. That would not, that would not, that would go against his very character. Romans 2.11 says, for God does not show favoritism, right? So just that thought in itself goes against what God's word says. God has chosen for us to always be involved, as we've seen throughout this series. God has chosen for us to always be involved by an act of faith to see those miracles take place in our lives. But God is just. God is a just God. And our faith act, listen, our faith act justifies him doing something for us that he does not do for everyone else. Why? Why? Why does one person receive a miracle and another doesn't? Because we would do what he told us to do, or they would do what God told them to do when others would not do. They would speak when others would remain silent. They would go when others would stay at home. They would, they would give when others would rather just sit on what they have and, and be fearful of what they have, as we saw last week. Um, they, would, they would do all those things and do whatever God told them to do. That's why it, God is just in healing someone and not healing someone else. For someone to receive a miracle and for one not to have it is because God has chosen to involve us. And this is what justifies. This is, this is his justice involved. As we, as we um, finish up today, I just want to say this, that when we are in those times when we're, we're praying and we're, we're asking God to do things, we need to make sure that we're reaching out to him, not as someone who is just begging God to do things, but we need to reach out to him in faith, confess what God has said and stand on those things. Be men, women, boys and girls who are actively living, standing, breathing, walking, everything day to day in faith. And when God tells us to do something, when God tells us to do something, we need to be ready to do, to immediately do. Just like that lady, when she heard that Jesus was there, she knew that she was going to receive and say, hey, I'm going to be healed today. And she left. She did everything, went to Jesus, and she received her healing. And we can do that too. We can come to him. We can come to him and we can listen to him and, and be healed when we're willing to do what he tells us to do. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for this word. Pray that you'll just help it to um, just come alive in us. Help us to understand what, um, what you would like to teach us. And God, we thank you for, um, for your healing power. God, we thank you for being our healer. And God, we trust you. We depend on you. And help us to follow you this week and help us to be sensitive to your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching today and thanks for being a part of our Relation family. Hey, if you live in the Four Corners area, we would love to see you in person at Elation Church. We meet right here in Four Corners, Sand Mine Road, off of Highway 27 at Citrus Ridge Academy every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. It's just a great time for you to join together with other believers and worship God. Hey, if this message was an encouragement to you, please like and share it. It's just a great way you can come alongside us in our mission to bring good news of great joy to all people. We'll see you right back here next week at Elation Church. This online worship experience was brought to you by the friends and partners of Elation Church.